so yeah, thanks for having me back. Uh, it's good to be here again. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Daniel Vanderwood. I'm a member of this church. I've been here since 2000, so about 18, going on 19 years now. Um, and so I started here when I was in high school and kind of grew up in this church from high school through college and now living back in Miami for the last several years um, and working here with Youth for Christ down here in Miami. So I'm going to touch on that a little bit in the sermon. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Um, so last week we heard about Peter, right? The Apostle Peter. Um, we heard how he became a disciple of Jesus, how Jesus called him, and a little bit about his character. Um, this week I get to preach on a disciple who we don't hear as much about, um, the disciple Andrew. So I have some fun facts for us about Andrew. Let's see if I can figure out which way this is supposed to go here. There we go. Um, so some fun facts about the disciple Andrew. Um, the first one is that he and the disciple John, um, we'll get into the scripture in a second, were the first two disciples to ever follow Jesus. Um, so we'll see that as we read through the passage today. Uh, the second one is he was actually the younger brother about Peter, who we heard about last week. So you can imagine what that was like, knowing what we know now about Peter being the outgoing, do things without thinking kind of person that he was. Um, Andrew was very much not like that, so I'll get to tell you a little bit about that today. Um, Almost every time he is mentioned in scripture, he is referred to as Andrew, the brother of Peter. So you can kind of get the idea that Andrew grew up maybe a little bit in the shadow of his brother Peter, um, because that is how he was known. So if you've ever been the person who, they're like, oh yeah, that's so-and-so, this person's son, or this person's daughter, or the younger brother of this person, that's Andrew. That's kind of the, the bubble that he grew up in. Um, and the last one <clears throat> that I love about him is that he was the first missionary, he actually brought his brother Peter to Jesus. So in the scripture that we saw today, that Lisa just went over with the kids, Peter is the one who says, you are the Messiah. But he didn't start out there. He started out long before that with his brother Andrew bringing him to Jesus. Um, and this is a theme we see throughout Andrew's story. Every time we see Andrew mentioned by himself, he's only mentioned about a dozen times in scripture. Um, and most of the times it's like Andrew and the other disciples, right? All the disciples, including Andrew or something like that. Um, but there's a few times where he's mentioned by himself that he does something um, that's noteworthy. And every time that he is mentioned specifically in scripture, he is bringing somebody to Jesus. So the first time we see that is actually in our story today. So if you turn with me to John chapter 1, we're going to pick up in verse 35. <clears throat> so I'll give you a second to get there. So it's John chapter 1, verse 35. And we pick up the story. This is with John the Baptist. Um, it's just after John the Baptist baptized Jesus, actually. And then this happens. It says, the next day, John, that's John the Baptist, was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, there we go again, was one of the two who heard, John, heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we've found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Let me pray. Father God, I just come before you again this morning. Thank you for bringing those of us who are here this morning here, and I pray for those who are not here as well, um, and for those who would hear this sermon later online. Um, I pray that it would not be me speaking my words up here, but it would be you speaking your words through me. Um, pray that you would bless this message, um, that it would speak to the hearts and the minds of those who hear it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, so I relate to Andrew um, because of the last point that you see on the slide there. He was the first missionary. So if you know me at all, if you've been around the church for a little while, you know that I am also a missionary and that I love to tell people about Jesus. Um, that's what I do for a living. And so, um, the, we, like I said, we pick up the story um, here in John chapter 1 uh, with John the Baptist, and he is baptizing people. Um, sorry, let me go back a second. He is baptizing people on the shore of the Jordan. Um, 
But I was not always a mission-minded person. I was not always in that mentality of telling everyone about Jesus. Um, when I started college in 2002, um, if you had told me at that time that someday I would be a missionary working with Youth for Christ here in Miami, I would have said, you're absolutely crazy. There's no way that that's going to happen. Um, when I went into college, um, I was pretty good at math and science, and so I was like, I'll go into engineering. They kind of combine the two, math and science, together, and I'll use those to make pretty good money. Engineers make pretty good money, and I'll live a comfortable life, and that was kind of my plan at that point. Um, Fortunately, and kind of unfortunately in, in my mind at that time, God had different plans for my life. Um, my freshman year of college, throughout the whole year, I heard God very, very clearly calling me into ministry. Um, it wasn't like I was walking outside one day and the clouds opened and I saw a bright light shine in my face and God said, I want you to go into ministry. No, it wasn't like that. It was more like I'd be hanging out with some friends in the dorms and we'd be talking and all of a sudden one of them would just say to me, hey, have you ever thought about going into ministry? I think you'd be really good at it. And I would look at them and I'd say, you're nuts. I don't think that's at all what I should be doing with my life. Um, and we would move on. And then I would be sitting in a chapel a couple weeks later, and there would be somebody speaking in the chapel, and there would be 400 people in the room. It would be a full room like this, full of people. And I would feel like just in the middle of whatever the speaker was saying, the speaker looked directly at me and say, God wants you to go into ministry. And if it had happened like once or twice, I probably would have just ignored it and moved on with my life and been an engineer. Um, but this happened throughout my entire freshman year of college. It was over and over and over. Many, many times I heard people and speakers in the chapels and all this kind of stuff say to me, you should go into ministry. And so as we pick up our story today, that's kind of what happens to Andrew. And don't worry, I'll tell you more about what happens later. Um, so where we pick up, Again, they're on the Jordan River, um, so it's kind of on the right side of the map. They're near, it says right before this, in the verse right before it, it says all these things are taking place near Bethany, beyond the Jordan. Um, so again, thinking from an Israelite perspective, their country is to the left of the Jordan River. So let me highlight Bethany is over here on the right. Um, so you see in John 1, 28, it says this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. That's John the Baptist. Um, so again, for them, their reference point was anything that was on the other side of the Jordan from them was on the far side of the Jordan, um, because there was actually a Bethany near Jerusalem as well, if you see on the map there. Um, and this is a very significant place in Israel's history. I don't think it was an accident that John the Baptist was here baptizing people. I think it was meant to be a reminder to the Israelite people that heard his message. Um, because if you look on the map, right over here, there's a city called Jericho. So if you remember in the Old Testament, when the Israelites finally cross over the Jordan River into the Promised Land, the land that God had told them, hey, this is what I'm giving you, this is my blessing to you, um, the first city that they come to and they conquer is the city of Jericho. So it was very likely that somewhere around Bethany is where they actually crossed the Jordan River, which if you don't know, in the Old Testament, there's actually two times that God parts bodies of water. The first time is when the Israelites cross the Red Sea. The second time is when they cross the Jordan River. God actually stops the Jordan River during flood season, which is crazy, and they cross on dry land, just like they did with the Red Sea. But if you know the Israelites' history a little bit, um, the time they crossed the Jordan River and went and conquered Jericho was not the first time that they came to the Jordan River. The first time they came to the Jordan River, we don't know exactly where they were, but they came to the Jordan River and God told them, you know, this is the promised land on the other side of the Jordan River is the promised land that I have for you. This is your inheritance. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you as you go over there. And so they sent 12 spies to kind of scout out the land and see what they were facing. And those spies came back, and the Israelite people did not trust God. They didn't trust him enough to, to go across the Jordan River into the blessings that he had for them. So we look in uh, Numbers chapter 13, verses 30 and 31. So Caleb, who was one of the 12 spies, said to the people who were kind of talking and they were discussing with each other, should we go or should we not? Um, he says, hey, quiet down and listen to Moses. And then he says, Let's go now and take possession of the land that we should be more than able to conquer it. There's no question. God is telling us to go. How can you possibly doubt that he will give us what we need to do this? But the men who had gone with him, the other spies, except for one, there was two guys who said they could do it. The other 10 said no. The men who had gone with him said, we cannot attack those people. They're too strong for us. They were scared. They were scared to, t to go across the Jordan River into the blessing that God had called them to. So, if we jump back over to our story today, sorry, ahead of myself there. Um, 
we pick up with Andrew. He's following John the Baptist. John the Baptist is on the, the edge of the Jordan River, again, very significant in Israel's history, and he's baptizing people. And his message to them is repent because the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for all this time, is coming. And so we pick up our story today with, um, we have Andrew and then John the disciple, not John the Baptist, are the two disciples that are there with John the Baptist that day, where he says, look, there's the Messiah. I just baptized him. We saw the Holy Spirit come down. That all happened. That's the guy. And so we see that Andrew has a choice to make. You know, he's been with um, John the Baptist probably for a little while now. His brother's not there, we know, so he's maybe going off track from what his family wants him to do. So he's already following a little bit of what God wants him to do in his life by following John the Baptist. His family were fishermen, we know that. They were, um, Peter is a fisherman at this point, um, fishing probably on the Sea of Galilee up in the northern part of Israel. Um, So Andrew's here with John the Baptist. John says, there's the Messiah, and Andrew has a choice to make. Is he going to stay with John the Baptist, or is he going to go and follow the Messiah? And we would probably say in our minds, well, of course, he's going to go follow the Messiah. What kind of question is that? But think about it from his perspective. He's been with John the Baptist for a little while. They've been baptizing all kinds of people. They're doing amazing ministry. They're seeing all kinds of lives change. That's a pretty good spot to be. That feels good. You're doing good work for God, right? But God had more in plan in store for him. So we see Andrew and John. As soon as John the Baptist says, there's the Messiah, the two disciples who heard him say this, those two, they immediately go and they follow Jesus. What a difference between what we saw with the Israelites in the Old Testament and what we see with Andrew here. Now keep in mind too, Andrew has no idea what to expect when he's going to go follow Jesus. All he knows is that this is the Messiah. He is going to be the Savior of Israel. At least that's what John the Baptist is telling him. But he doesn't know what it's going to cost him. He doesn't know if he's going to die for following this guy. He doesn't know where he's going to eat his meals. I mean, with John the Baptist, at least they probably had like steady meals every day and they kind of knew the routine and they were comfortable there to some degree, right? Um, When he gets to Jesus, you know, they even ask where Jesus is staying. They don't know where Jesus is even staying that night. I think that's these two contrasting positions when it comes to God calling us in life is kind of where we land when we have to make that choice. When God calls you in life, you have two choices to make. You have lack of trust in God or you can trust God. Um, How often do we miss out on things that God is calling us to or the blessings that God is wanting to give us because we don't have enough trust in God? I know I've been there. Um, Again, with my story, When God called me into ministry, I would love to say that I was like, Yahoo, let's go. It's going to be awesome. But that was not the case. I did not trust God enough at that point in my life. Even though I heard him calling me over and over my freshman year, it took all the way to the end of my freshman year before finally I was like, really tentatively, okay, God, let's give this a shot. And even then, I kind of, if you know the story of Gideon in the Old Testament where he puts the fleece out because he's not sure he wants to trust God and what God is calling him to, that's kind of what I did. I was like, all right, God, if you really want me to go into ministry, then make this certain thing happen and not this other thing, and that's what happened. I was like, oh, dang, you know, Um, because I didn't trust God. And there was reasons for that. You know, I didn't think I was that good of a Christian. I'm like, how can I tell other people about God when I'm not even a good Christian myself? I'm a horrible sinner. How can I tell other people about God? There was a lot of fear that was there. And we see that with the Israelites in the Old Testament too. So that's one side of it. We can lack trust in God or we could trust God like we see Andrew do today. And I think we can learn from that. Um, And I'm not saying it's easy to follow God's call in your life. I'm not saying that at all. It has not been an easy journey being a missionary. There's been lots of times where I've had to rely a lot on God. Um, But God is always faithful through that. And I think God doesn't ever call us into something that's easy. I don't think that when God calls us into something, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to call you into this, but I know that you can handle it yourself. I'll just call you and ask you to do that, and then I'm going to leave you alone. That's not how God calls us. He always calls us to do things that we are not comfortable doing. So the first point I want us to remember is that it's when we're outside of our capability, when we're outside of what we can handle on our own, when we're outside of where we're comfortable That's when we're in a place where we have to rely on him completely, and that's right where he wants us to be. When we're in that place, that's where God wants us to be, because that's when his glory is, or he is the one that's glorified, not us. If we're the one who can do everything on our own, and he calls us, and we, we can do it, then we're the one who can just say, yeah, I'm awesome, and I did that. But it's when we're outside of that, when we're doing things that God is calling us to, 
not because we're able to do it, but because we are trusting in him, that's when people around us can see, wow, there's no way that they could do that on their own. Um, And so that's what happens when we follow God, when we trust in him. If you don't believe me, um, we're going to look at the second time that we see Andrew. So the first time is here in the passage that we read today. The second time we see Andrew is actually at the feeding of the 5,000. So we're going to look at that story today. So when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread to feed all these people? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. I think that's an important thing to notice too, is that God already has in mind what he's going to do. When he calls us to do something, it's not like he's calling us and he's like, well, I hope you figure it out. No, he already knows what's going to happen. He already has it planned. So Philip answers him, as I probably would, and most of us probably would, it's going to take more than half a year's wages to buy enough food for all these people to eat. And then everybody's going to get one bite of bread, and that's going to be it. So he's looking at the problem. Another one of his disciples, though, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Well, here's a boy with five loaves of bread and two small fish. But how far is that going to go among so many? So while the other disciples were focusing on the problem, Andrew's looking around for a solution. I love that. And again, you see just, it's not a lot of faith. It doesn't have to be a lot of faith, but at least he has a little bit of faith here in the story. He, he, instead of focusing on, oh my goodness, this is, there's more people here than we could ever possibly afford to feed. He just starts looking around. He says, well, Jesus asked us to do it. So what do we have to work with? And he finds this boy who's got his lunch there and he brings it to Jesus. Again, bringing it to Jesus. Um, And so that's, kind of a theme for this sermon too, is just bring it to Jesus. Um, He doesn't think that he could take the five loaves of bread and two fish and multiply it and feed everyone himself. He has no idea how it's going to work even. He's like, how far is that going to go among all these people? But he trusts Jesus. He trusts Jesus. He's seen Jesus work enough already at this point that he just is like, well, we'll we'll just bring it to Jesus. We'll see what happens. Um, And I think sometimes these stories in the Bible We read them, like Jesus feeding the 5,000, and we're like, man, that's awesome. That's such a cool miracle. But I don't know if God still works that way today. And so one of the things that has been happening in my life in the last six months or so, well, there's been a lot of things happening in my life in the last six months or so, as some of you know, um, but I want to share some of that testimony with you so that you can understand, and hopefully it will strengthen your faith like God's been working on mine. Um, So last year, I got married to my wonderful wife, Christina, Um, that alone was a huge way that God was working in my life and God was calling me into something that I was not necessarily comfortable with at that time, but it has been a huge blessing since then. Um, And like I mentioned earlier, I'm a missionary. I work with Youth for Christ. If you know anything about people in ministry or especially missionaries, it's kind of like this running joke in the Christian family that they just don't make a lot of money. And that's true. Um, The joke is like, if you want to make money, you don't go and be a missionary. Um, So, Again, over the years, I've been a missionary now for about 13 years with Youth for Christ, so it's been a long journey. It hasn't been a short one. Um, And throughout that time, over and over, I've had to trust God in many different things, and always he has been faithful to provide. So last year, he provided me with an amazing wife, um, who I love very much. And um, it was not something that I was expecting to happen. Um, For those of you who are around, it kind of happened fast. We got married pretty quickly. Um, But there was a lot of prayer that went into that. It was not us jumping into marriage because, you know, we're just attracted to each other and it was awesome or whatever. No, we spent a lot of time praying and we were seeking God's guidance on that. We spoke to a lot of Christian friends that we knew and everything that we saw, everything, all the signs that God gave us pointed to us getting married. Um, So we were trusting in him in that. Again, I was not expecting to have to support another person on my salary last year um, or even this year. And so along the way, it's also been a challenge for us where we've had to really, really rely on God. Um, I'm the only one working. Christina is studying right now to take her test to become a doctor here in the U.S., but right now she's not working. So now it's two people living on a missionary salary, which is before it was barely enough to support me by myself. Um, So again, this has been a long process of prayer. It was not us being awesome and doing anything ourselves. Um, So there was three times, um, three kind of experiences in the last six months where we really, really had to rely on God financially. So I want to share those with you. And again, hopefully this boosts your faith like God's been boosting mine. So the first one is part of the reason we got married when we did um, is because we wanted to start the immigration process for Christina. She's from Venezuela. And um, we didn't want her to have to go back there. 
And so we, started, we got married and we started the immigration process. Um, but for anyone who's familiar with it, immigration is not cheap, um, especially for somebody who doesn't make a lot of money. Um, so we talked to a few different lawyers and we were praying a lot, like, God, I don't know how we're gonna afford this. We don't have the money right now. Um, thankfully, God led us to a paralegal who helped us with the immigration process and has been wonderful so far. Um, through one of Christina's friends. So that helped bring the cost down a lot. And then on top of that, as you know, I was kind of saving because I knew this was coming up as much as I could, but we still weren't quite there. And then one day we were here at church and we had somebody from the congregation come up to us and just hand us a check and say, hey, this is you know, from us to you. We feel like God is leading us to give this to you to help with the immigration cost. And sure enough, that check was exactly the difference that we needed to cover the costs for the immigration. That was one. There's more. Um, the second one, um, and if you don't know me, I get stressed out about this kind of stuff, especially finances, because you know I'm the man, I'm supposed to provide for the family, I'm the one working, all this kind of stuff. So this stuff stresses me out. So I've had to really, really like trust in God in, this, in these things. So the second one was um, her tests. So in order to become a doctor here in the United States, she has to take a series of tests, and they're very expensive. I think all the tests put together is almost $5,000. Again, money that we don't have. So we've been saving as we can a little bit each month to try and you know, save up for those tests um, and praying a lot. Like, God, if you want this to happen, you know, make it happen. Um, so we recently went to Chicago for Christmas and we had a great time on vacation there. I just kind of chose to put aside the worries that I had you know, waiting for me at home and just enjoy the vacation. Um, but we got back from that trip and it was back to reality. And so the day after we got back from the trip, we were sitting in our room at night and going over our finances and looking at the bills we had to pay. And I'm like, it doesn't add up. The numbers don't add up. At the end of the month, after we pay off all the bills, we're not gonna have any money to save for your tests. And I don't know how we're gonna do this. We want this to happen in the next couple months and I just don't know how it's gonna happen. Well, God, of course, you know, likes to slap me on the back of the head and say, why are you not trusting me? Um, you should know by now. And so the next morning, one of my friends texts me, and we're texting back and forth and talking, and then kind of out of the blue, he just says to me, hey, my wife and I have been talking, and God blessed us, and so we want to bless you. And so we're going to pay for Christina's first test. And the, like, she needs some practice tests to get ready for it and stuff. We're going to pay for all of that. Again, we didn't ask them for money. We never really talked to them too much about it. They knew that she was kind of in this process. They didn't you know, know anything about it, but they just decided to do that. God told them to do that. That was two. Number three, that same week, um, we had to, and I know this is like mundane, everyday stuff, but again, I think God works in those things in our lives. Um, we had to pay my car insurance, our car insurance, for the car that we have. And, you know, we do it every six months or so. It was coming to be that time. Well, last June, I was in a car accident. And so because of that, my car insurance was doubling. And the next time we had to pay it, it was going to double. And I'm looking at it again. I'm like, we barely had enough money to pay it when it wasn't double. I don't know how this is going to work. It was a lot of money. So we're looking at it, trying to figure it out. You know, I go online. I look at a bunch of different car insurances, managed to find one that was a little bit less, still quite a bit more than we were paying before. But, you know, I'm like, if we pay this with the money that we have in the bank account now, we're not going to have money to pay the rest of the bills at the end of the month. So I don't know how that's going to work, but we prayed, and we paid it, and trusted God. The next day, we got to church, and we were hanging out in the community center before the service, and somebody came up to us and handed us an envelope and said, hey, it's not from me. It's from somebody else. They just want to be anonymous, so I don't even know who this was. If it was you, thank you. You're awesome. Um, and Christina and I were just, like, in shock, and we didn't know how much was in the envelope, but we were just kind of, like, crying and, and thanking God and thanking whoever this person was. And so we get in the car on the way home from church, and we open up the envelope, and it was exactly enough money to cover the car insurance that we had paid for the day before. So again, um, if you don't trust God, if you don't have faith, take my word for it that God is faithful and he does provide. Um, there was also a verse that was with the money in the envelope, and I think it's very fitting for the sermon today. It says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. How true is that? From Philippians 4.19. Um, and then last week, we had another blessing. I don't know why God decided to, to give this to us. Again, we're ta our needs are taken care of right now, but we had somebody else come up to us last week and, again, just give us some more money and say, hey, this is to help pay for Christina's tests. So over and over and over in the last six months have I seen God providing 
in just miraculous ways. Again, we didn't put out there, hey, we need money, we're in trouble, we, we need help with all this stuff. We never did that. We just prayed, and God has been blessing us over and over and over. Now, I want to be careful, because unfortunately, there's some false gospels out there that say, if you believe in Jesus, you're going to get rich. Um, that's not true. Don't believe that, please. Um, and that's not what I'm saying. We're not rich by any means because of what God has been blessing us with. But our needs have been taken care of. God has very much provided for our needs. Um, and I think there's other ways that God provides for our needs, too. I don't think it's just money. Um, like I said, God provided an amazing wife for me last year that I wasn't expecting, came out of nowhere. Um, but I do think that until you step out in faith and you start trusting God, like if Christina and I had never gotten married because I didn't think we could afford it financially, we would not have seen all the blessings that we're seeing now. And I think that is true. That until you step out in faith and you really start to follow where God is leading you outside of where you're comfortable, you're not going to see God's blessings in your life as much as you would if you do that. I'm not saying you can't see any, but I don't think you see them as much. Um, and my faith has grown tremendously in the last six months through this experience. And along with that faith comes peace and comes joy, like God promises us in the scriptures. Because I know now, more than I did six months ago, that I can trust God, that I can rely on him, that he is going to be faithful and he's going to take care of me. So where is God calling you to follow him today? That's what I want you to think about. Where is God calling you to follow him today? Where do you feel like he's tugging at your heart, where he's leading you? But maybe you've been stuck in your comfort zone. I want to challenge all of us today. Don't stay there. Don't stay where you're comfortable. It's easy to do. But man, when you step outside of that, when God is calling you to do something and you follow him into that, it's incredible the things that he's going to do in your life. So Jesus is giving you the same invitation that he gave to Andrew in the scripture that we read today. He says, come and you will see. Let's pray.